so since y'all can already hear us, hello, welcome. As you can see on our screen, we do have Adam Habig here with Freedom HealthWorks, Dr. Ulp, and Dr. Eskew. And this is the second series in the Freedom Doc webinar series. Um, so with that, um, we actually have these planned out all the way through October. And you will receive a recording to today's webinar within 24 to 48 hours. And I will hand it over to Adam and he will introduce the doctors. Thank you, Skylar. And I will present a few slides. Uh, bear with me just as an introduction. Got to remind me how to present. It's been a, a few days since we did this. There's that share screen component of screen. Oh. Got it. Share screen, and I'm going to share the screen. Okay, perfect. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Hopefully everyone can see that. Great. Thank you, everyone, and welcome back to episode two of the uh, Freedom Doc series focused on direct-to-consumer healthcare in association with Lean Frontiers. And Freedom Health Works, we have a, a really exciting uh, lineup today with some great guest speakers. So thank you all for joining again. I uh, just wanted to recap again the the underlying structure of this web series. Um, these are a series of short, emphasizing short lunchtime webinars to educate, evaluate, and move interested stakeholders forward. Uh, we will try to get you out of here on time today. So appreciate you tuning in. Uh, we do tend to start broad and then narrow in on subject matter, and, and uh, we'll recap last episode, uh, or episode one, I should say, which was more of an overview uh, in the next slide, but we'll stay, we'll stay on topic and, and stay on track today. Um, to get the most out of this series again, uh, be sure to provide feedback. We thrive on your questions, and uh, today at the end of the, um, the episode, we're also going to tackle some of the most prominent questions that emerged from your feedback, but we do enjoy hearing the good and the bad. So please do uh, provide that feedback. Let us know what you enjoyed, what you did not enjoy about today's episode and how we can make this better and continue to tune in. We'll, we'll make these available. I know Lean Frontiers will make these available uh, if you can't tune in uh, live, but if you miss an episode, by all means, go back and check it out. So just by way of brief uh, introduction to uh, this series and, and, and really to recap the first episode from last month. Again, this series is designed to illuminate innovation in medical care delivery through the adoption of direct-to-consumer business models. And these really borrow best practices from other service industries, which have far outpaced uh, medical care in terms of delivering value and satisfaction to consumers. So uh, episode one uh, portrayed a high-level overview of the, the fundamental components for success. And here you see some of those points uh, itemized. Uh, key components like pricing clarity, convenience, uh, fully focused medical expertise on the critical issues at hand. Um, you see the key omissions that we talked about last episode. You know, no third party payment getting in the way, no hidden charges or surprise bills, no waiting for an appointment, uh, and no misalignment of interest between the physician and the customer, the patient in this case. Um, at the heart of, of direct-to-consumer services is really this elimination of intermediaries. And um, in healthcare, that means, you know, excising the third-party payers who have really taken on a disproportionately intrusive role over the last 40 years. Um, today, we're going to hear from a couple of great panelists, um, Dr. Phil Eskew and Dr. Ashley Olp. Um, they will describe in detail um, two of them Care that are related uh, to the direct-to-consumer movement, but often get mixed up. And so many of you had questions on, you know, how to compare and contrast really concierge. Since you're getting a little frozen. We have our favorites, uh, and you'll probably see those today come through. But really a, a healthy, vibrant, array of choices for consumers and for doctors is the hallmark 
of a thriving medical marketplace. Giving people choices, giving doctors choices is great. So I just wanna say that, that while we may have our, our favorites among the different variants, um, you know, the, the, the emergence of these different alternatives is really the opposite of, it's the polar opposite of a one size fits all really monolithic single payer system where innovation stagnates amidst bureaucracy. So um, again, we're gonna hear today about two of those uh, different uh, models, concierge and direct pay, uh, but we encourage all forms of direct to consumer healthcare, whatever variants they might be. So um, with that, I will pass this off to Dr. Phil Eskew. Uh, I'd say one of the, the leading minds at the intersection of the medical legal business side of this movement. So Dr. Eskew, thank you for joining us today. So, so I'll, do a, I'll do a screen share here. And we're gonna start. So the, the focus is to say, what's the difference between DPC and concierge? And I've, so this is my website, it's DPC Frontier. And I've got this definition here that is an amalgam of what many different states follow as they feel the need to define DPC. So uh, the majority of states now, I'm happy to say, do define DPC in some way, shape, or form. It's also defined federally in the Affordable Care Act and in some other regulations that have taken place related to uh, the need to define it for tax purposes. So DPC practices charge a periodic fee. So usually it's monthly, but it might be quarterly, it might be some other time frame that you and the patient come up with. They don't bill a third party on a fee for service basis. And if they do charge a per visit charge, it's less than that monthly fee basically. So if you're charging, imagine a model where you charge uh, $90 uh, per visit and $10 a month. That's interesting, there's nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't get unwanted attention from the insurance commissioner. It's more like some sort of discount urgent care setup. And it's not sort of incentivizing the same kind of ongoing care relationship that you usually see in DPC if the per visit charge is so much higher than the monthly fee. So that's how this was, you know, uh, come up with, I guess, as a, as a group over the years. And there's that a longer explanation is, is right there for you as well. And then right up here, this kind of shows how different states looked at things initially. And these were the things that were usually found in their DPC definition at, at the state law level. These older original states were the first ones, these West Virginia, Washington, and Oregon were the first three to do it. And people didn't quite figure out what they were doing initially. And uh, those, those laws in West Virginia have since been corrected in Washington, Oregon. I anticipate they'll eventually make some updates as well. So these are the things that you would usually find in a, in a law that's defining DPC. So most people are used to making assumptions. If, if a practice advertises as concierge, then it's probably at a higher price point, kind of like a, a luxury car versus a regular car. And those assumptions are accurate. Concierge practices do charge a higher price point. But state law, as far as I'm aware, never defines concierge practices. Arkansas did briefly till they realized they didn't mean to do that. And then they sort of pulled that definition back and did define DPC practices. So remember that a DPC practice is intentionally not charging any insurance uh, on, a, on a regular fee-for-service basis for the care that's delivered. And in the concierge practice, at least the larger known models like MDVIP and others, they do charge that regular fee-for-service amount. And then they have a monthly fee that's over and above that amount that's designed to cover all the stuff that insurance hasn't paid for for years. They have to make a carefully crafted legal argument so that that additional monthly fee is for non-covered services. Otherwise you can get in contractual trouble with an insurance company or uh, legal trouble with a Medicare or Medicaid uh, situation. So that's the big difference between the two. And because they, the, a concierge practice is still charging that fee for service amount, those practices historically have never had the same kind of attention from a state insurance regulator because the insurance regulator sees those fees that are happening at each visit and is not fearful of any kind of miscommunication about what's being provided or any kind of overutilization where too many patients would want a service that was maybe overpromised and underdelivered. So because they've never felt the need to go after those practices, those practices have never really been defined at the state level and they've never needed to be defined. Insurance companies probably don't like them, but there's 
legally nothing they can do about them. So it just is what it is. So that's kind of the legal overview and I'll, I'll stop with the uh, sharing for now and uh, happy to pass it on to Dr. Alp. Thank you. Adam, do you have my slides? And do you know how to share them? Sorry, Dr. Ulp. Skylar, any help there? Do you have uh, some slides for Dr. Ulp? While we're waiting, I will handle some of the questions that were in here earlier. Um, people ask, can both models be used simultaneously, like DPC and concierge, could you do them together? Theoretically, it's possible. It's a little challenging and it, it's, from a business standpoint, maybe difficult because with a concierge model, you're still doing all your fee-for-service billing. So your staff and your overhead are higher with that than they would be in DPC. And the other thing you have to be careful of is if you have one cohort of patients here where you're making a concierge argument and you're saying the monthly fee is only for non-covered services, and you've got another over here where you're making a DPC argument and saying this monthly fee is for both covered and non-covered services, then that becomes messy and your own model can be used to kind of undo yourself. So you have to be real careful that the, the services provided, there is a genuine difference between the two. And you also, whether you want to or not, when you're in a concierge model, my legal opinion is that you still need to bill those fee-for-service charges even if you didn't want to. So in other words, in DPC, you're sort of happy to not do that paperwork usually and that's part of the motivation for it. But if you wanted to make the argument that your monthly fee was just for non-covered services, for that argument to hold water, you need to still bill for covered services. Otherwise, the regulator can come in and say, well, I know you said this was for non-covered services, but I haven't seen a single charge for a covered service from your office in the last year. So clearly you're working covered services into this. So that's, that's one, one more comment I would that's say. That's a great, great distinction. Uh, thank you. Dr. Ope, I do have your slides now. I apologize. Okay. Uh, we'll cue those up, okay? And That's just, okay. I can just, get started. You can tell me when to, when to move on from one slide to the next. Okay. Well, and I'm kind of just sharing my story so I know my own story. <laughs> but um, it's a long and convoluted one, so I always debate how much of it to tell because it could take three hours. So for the purposes of this, I won't do that. Um, but kind of to make it a shorter story. I spent 15 years in a traditional private practice. We were not hospital owned, we were independent, but it was a traditional practice in that we build insurance. It was a traditional fee for service model with 10 to 15 minute appointments for patients. Um, and I did that for 15 years. And what triggered me to switch my practice to DPC was really my personal experience as a patient. So this is the part of the story that gets long that I'm gonna make short. Um, and I'm gonna start at the end and then go backwards. But the end of the story is that I have a diagnosis of external iliac artery endofibrosis, which is not a common injury, but it is well-documented and it's an injury that's specific to endurance athletes. And I finally received the diagnosis in 2012 um, by my own hand, ordering all of my own tests. But my symptoms started way back in 2001, I was in residency and started having what I described to the doctors I was seeing as claudication. I specifically used that word. Um, and basically over the ensuing 11 years, I probably saw around 15 different specialists, everything ranging from sports medicine to orthopedic surgery, neurology, neurosurgery, physiatry, and then lots of other branches of care from physical therapists, athletic trainers, massage therapists, lots of different care providers to try to figure out this claudicating leg pain. And in between that time, I also had two physicians who were willing to do major surgery on my leg, presuming that it was neurogenic claudication, um, mostly because nobody could understand why somebody who's a 30 year old runner would have vascular related leg pain. So I had two surgeries that were unnecessary in that time. Um, and my experience really every single time was lots of frustration in getting a hold of a doctor, calling offices and often getting voicemail, um, leaving messages that were unreturned, talking to front office staff members who were very kind but never really got me any answers that I needed. 
waiting weeks and weeks to get an appointment with yet the next specialist who spent 10 minutes with me and had very little time to get any of my history. They would order a test or two when it didn't provide the right answer, they would refer me on to the next specialist. So over years and years of time, I saw many specialists, my symptoms just getting worse and worse. And I kept running through all this time. I, long distance running was my hobby, still is, and that's, um, that's kind of part and parcel of this injury. And finally, after my second erroneously done surgery, I decided to take matters into my own hands. I was so tired of dealing with waiting and office staff that didn't know how to answer questions and doctors that had no time and lots of ordering tests. Um, there were many occasions where I would use the word claudication and specifically ask for an MRA or a CTA and that notion was um, usually just sort of ignored. So finally, after my second surgery in 2012, I ordered my own MRA, and what do you know, my iliac artery was completely fibrosed down, and I was living on collateral circulation. <laughs> By that point, I was in severe pain, hardly walking, let alone running. So I got myself to the correct type of surgeon and had a vascular bypass graft placed. That was in 2012. Um, then from then through 2016, it was, I was fraught with complications, a couple of different acute thromboses and problems with the graft. So I had to have a couple of corrective surgeries on that leg. And in between there, a couple of pregnancies. <laughs> um, but the big, the big final deciding factor was in 2016 when I had an acute thrombus in my graft and um, could not get a hold of the surgeon's office, called three times that morning pretty desperate saying, I think I need to be seen today and explain what was going on and nobody would call me back. So I ended up ordering my own CTA, which I was able to get stat, found a huge thrombus, went in for emergency surgery. And then I had five days to kind of convalesce in the hospital and reflected over the previous 15 years. <laughs> and I kind of thought, you know, I can't keep practicing the way I'm practicing because what had been happening to me for now, 15 years, I was doing to my patients. And I, I, I could never get a hold of a doctor. I could never get any answers. I could never get anybody on the phone, but let alone the doctor. I never got time in front of somebody. And now I've had all these surgeries and all these complications. And I just became convinced that if somebody had sat down with me for 30, 45 minutes and heard my whole story and heard my explanations, I think I would have been diagnosed much earlier and certainly avoided some surgeries and complications. Um, so I kind of decided by the end of that hospitalization, I was gonna change the way I practiced. And the, the big things that I had identified as problems were access to a doctor, time with a doctor. And, and the side story was all of the odd medical billing. You never knew how much money you were gonna spend. You never knew how much anything cost. All the tests I had ordered, I would get bills often 60 days later with no explanation for what the cost was. The doctors never knew how much tests were gonna cost. The hospital never knew how much anything was gonna cost. And so that was very frustrating. That last hospitalization I left with a bill for $104,000. And so I asked for an itemized bill and in, the, in there you see that a dose of Tylenol was $50 and I was apparently renting a bedside commode that I never used. All these different items were on this bill that, that were a surprise to me, that were shockingly expensive, and some of it was completely unnecessary. So that triggered me to start doing some research, and I interviewed several local doctors here in Indianapolis, which is where I practice. Um, some of them were doing concierge medicine, and at the time, I'd actually never heard of DPC. But I knew I needed to get out of this traditional model where I had no time with my patients. Um, so I'd interviewed multiple physicians and then randomly through a, an, a different connection, I was connected to um, the Habigs at Freedom HealthWorks and learned about DPC. And to me, that solved the three big issues, the access to the doctor. All of my patients can call me directly. So if they have a simple question or a complicated one, I'm the one that answers their question. I wanted more time with my patients and I think that's what I needed as a patient. Um, so DPC allowed me to have as long or as short of appointments as I wanted. I was not answering to insurance at all. So I could often have a conversation over text or I can bring somebody in for 90 minutes, which I do on a regular basis and anything in between. 
And then the, the third thing, and this is what I think makes things really simple for patients too, is there's no billing mystery. The patients just pay a monthly fee, almost like a gym membership. <laughs> And they can talk to me every day or they can talk to me zero times that month, but all the services I provide are covered in that monthly fee. So there's no mystery. And I specifically have listed on my website exactly what the services are. So Dr. Eskew, to your point, there's not gonna be a mystery of what's a covered service and what's not. Basically, I tell my patients, anything I can do for you in my office is covered under that monthly fee. So it could be a skin procedure, it could be a cortisone injection, um, anything. Anything I can do in the office for them is covered under that fee. So they never get a bill from me other than the once a month bill that comes through. So that's it. That's my super long story in about eight minutes. And a great story, Dr. Roll. Thank you for sharing. So I, uh, I have to ask, are you still, you're still running? Oh yeah, still yeah. running. Okay. Yeah, I'm not going to stop doing that until I'm completely broken. <laughs> so. Nobody could talk you into swimming or cycling. It's still running. No, it's still running. Yes. <laughs> hey, Dr. Eskew, I might ask some of these points that I just, I was a little slow transitioning the slide. I apologize, Dr. Alt. But some of the points that the Dr. Alt pointed out that are kind of distinctions between the two models, one of the, you know, some of the reasons why she um, chose direct pay versus concierge. These would see and seem endemic to the model as you were describing the way concierge medicine operates and you know, in, 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 if I could term it somewhat of a hybrid manner. Um, can you expound a bit on that? Why perhaps you know, some of these are, um, in, some of these are, are, are apparent in direct pay but not in concierge just based on the structure, the way it's set up? Are you talking to me or to Dr. Askew? I had thrown that back to Dr. Askew, but... Uh... Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so the, the, you've got the overhead piece. So if we're going off this slide here, why is it more expensive for patients? Because they're still, uh, they're still using their insurance. So if you, had a, if you go back in time, you know, 20 years when patients had $1,000 deductibles, it did make more sense because they, they, in this uh, lottery system that everybody was playing this game where you had to chase after your deductible and hit it to get value out of your insurance. By doing concierge, you were helping them get to that point and, and surpass it and then come out ahead in terms of what they paid that plan. Now it's a fool's errand with a deductible that's five, six, seven grand. And it really rarely makes sense to, are you rarely are you helping the patient by billing their insurance in that way? And if you maintain the setup to build their insurance even when you didn't want to. What, what in reality is happening for most of these patients is they're paying that monthly concierge fee and then the, the stuff that is billed to insurance still winds up being just an, an additional charge directly to the patient at the time of visit because the insurance company is looking at the bill and saying, hmm, that's nice. You haven't met your deductible yet. Here, patient pay this. So it does Makes get sense. more expensive for them that way. Yeah, yes. thank you. Makes sense. Go ahead, Dr. Alt, please. Well, so along those same lines, um, as I was doing research and initially researching just concierge, because that was what I knew about, um, and then learned about DPC, that was the big deciding factor for me is when you still are billing insurance, you don't have that price transparency. And you're very beholden to what the insurance company will and won't let you do. And a big part of what I wanted to do was what I needed for my own doctors, which was to be able to advocate for my patients. Um, and so I can make a phone call myself to a specialist to get information. And then that patient's not running off to the specialist um, and spending more money. So it was more personal, but also you got rid of that whole third party payer, which I think was a big part of the problem. Um, just, just for me being a patient, they didn't get more than 10 minutes with me. Mm -hmm. um, and again, no transparency in pricing. I never knew how much money I was spending. Mm -hmm. Sure. Dr. Rolp, can, this is a question that comes up quite a bit, and I thought this might be a good time. I know you've got a, a thriving patient panel. Could you just describe your patient panel a bit? And I, uh, just some, some uh, you know, a general overview, what, what your patients look like, because and I'll just, I'll just say it. Concierge has a, a, a ring of uh, it, it sounds expensive. It seems like a, it's a much higher price point than a direct pay model. So could you just maybe give the audience a, a little bit of a, a glimpse into what your patient panel looks like? 
Yeah, it probably looks like everybody else's patient panel. <laughs> it's just, so I limit my practice to 500 patients. I think I have around 520 right now, um, but I limit it so that I have time and availability, which is the whole point of doing this. But it looks like everybody else's patient panel. I think it runs the gamut from, um, I think all socioeconomic places. A lot of my patients look like me. They're sort of in their 30s, 40s, 50s with families and working. So they're um, busy and they don't want to take a half day off of work to come in and see the doctor, especially if they can just text me in the morning with their symptoms. And a lot of primary care problems are solved through dialogue. You don't always have to do a real involved physical exam. Um, but I mean, I think it's kind of a short answer to your question. They just, they look like it always looked. It's just a much smaller group of people. I don't think it necessarily um, eliminates anybody. The prices are cheap enough. So my practice is $100 a month, which is probably less than you pay for your cell phone. It's less than I pay for my phone. <laughs> um, so it's affordable to almost everybody. So I don't think it, it doesn't eliminate groups of people because of price, let's put it that way. Great, super. Well, shall we move on to uh, the FAQs that have come in from the group and, and expound on some of those? Here's a great one. This appeared several times uh, and, and you've, you've both touched on this, but if you had to, to create an elevator pitch for the, the difference between these two models, what would that be in just a sentence or two? I know we've talked about price point. We've talked about the kind of the hybrid billing features of concierge. Is that how you would describe it? Uh, one still features third-party payment at some level and a higher price point versus a direct pure pay? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, that's fair. I don't really think of this in terms, I mean, this is always, this always becomes a more nuanced conversation. So there's not really, there's not gonna be an elevator, you know, don't bring this up in the elevator with a patient would be our first comment. There's no elevator pitch here. Like, do not get into this. Whatever model you decide, don't clarify it between the two with the patient. Just describe what you're doing and, and hopefully that'll be enough. They're, they're not gonna to wanna to get into uh, complicated discussions like this. Makes sense. Dr. Rolf, would you add anything to that as far as uh, the distinctions? Um, well, just tangential to that is the amount of paperwork and busy work you're doing because there is no third party payer goes down 95%. So I'm not spending any of my time filling out PA forms um, and doing paperwork that's unnecessary and not even relevant to the patient's health because it's just so simple. You pay a monthly fee and you get your primary care. Makes sense. So to, to kind of just punctuate that, if, if as a layperson I said, what is the difference between these two models? Uh, with a concierge model, you still have a hybrid type practice where you are both taking, taking uh, uh, fees directly from your patients and then billing uh, their insurance for reimbursement. And that also features usually a price point, a higher monthly price point for each of your patients. Whereas mm -hmm. direct pay, you're talking a much lower monthly price point, as you mentioned, $100 a month or less, Dr. Olp, and zero uh, billing third parties for reimbursement. Is that a fair litany? Okay, mm -hmm. great. And so, I, you know, I guess the, the elevator retort here maybe is if a patient calls and says, oh, I wish you'd done concierge, then I could still use my insurance my comment back would be, well, you're still getting used by your insurance. But not really <laughs> using your insurance. Love that. And I often say, I, I you know, it, direct, direct pay is, I say, concierge level service as well. Uh, it, it may have, you know, if, if we're distinguishing between the two models, I think that you get almost everything you'd get in a concierge model in terms of the upgraded customer service with the direct pay model. Um, so I know that, that that causes some confusion, but you know, people like the, the term concierge in many other industries and in different aspects of life. So, uh, but it has come to mean something distinct in medicine. Appreciate that. The second question we had, this is interesting. How are prices set in each model? Uh, Dr. Wolf, you want to tackle that one? How you came about to set your prices, I guess, in the, in the direct pay sense? Um, I wish I could say there was a really involved, complicated thought process. <laughs> There really wasn't. Um, so Freedom Health Works, you guys helped me a lot kind of figure out what the market looks like and what some average prices are. Um, and then honestly, I just sort of logically thought $100 a month for most people is very reachable. Um, and it's not, it's not out of reach for most people and it's not super expensive. 
for all that you're going to get. And it's much less expensive at the end of the year if you add up how much you're going to pay for four or five office visits um, in a year, it, you're going to spend approximately $1,000 to $1,200, which is about what it would cost to be part of my DPC practice. But in between there, you can see me as many times as you want. You can text me at seven in the morning because your kid's sick and you want to know if it's strep throat. So there's a lot more interaction. They make Patients may come in four times a year, but the touch points between each patient is probably closer to once or twice a month. So in the end, they're saving a lot of money at that $100 a month price point. So there, there wasn't a big formula I used. It was a little bit of advice from you guys and looking at market prices and then just settling on a nice even number. <laughs> sure. I think that the prevailing price in, in, in uh, direct uh, primary care, direct care medicine, especially primary care level, seem to gravitate between that uh, on the low end, maybe $60 a month. On the high end, maybe you know 100, maybe a little bit higher, uh, and that's that's not to say one is better than the other, but there's that prevailing price point. Whereas concierge medicine, we're typically talking multiples of that. And I don't know. Um, do the one of you know how concierge practices set those prices? Is that I know they typically have a smaller, perhaps a smaller patient pain. Um, at some level, it, it seems that even the out-of-pocket charges, even though they are getting. Uh, the reimbursements, the out-of-pocket charges are still several multiple of that mm -hmm. DPC average. Yeah, they've been, the, the, the data is kind of all over the place there. I think, you know, even DPC practices I've seen range from $40 to $500 a month. Mm -hmm. And I think the interesting thing is that you, you have your exceptions on both sides, but patients generally expect about what they're paying for. So if, if you're on the lower side at $40 and your panel's larger and you're not spending quite as much time with them as, the, as somebody who's charging a lot more, then I think they get that. And if you're charging $500 a month and you don't spend, a, you know, you don't follow them into the hospital and do the other things that those practices commonly do, then they're going to be disappointed as well. And the concierge groups, how do they set their prices? I guess you'd have to ask them. I will say that generally speaking, a lot of service industries, this certainly is true in law, uh, they have a what's called a Veblen good phenomenon, where rather than having an obvious price quality correlation, there are assumptions about quality based on your price point. And we all do this sometimes when you go to the store, you know, you, could, you can look at whatever, um, product you're going to buy and you see a name brand one there and you see the one that doesn't have the name brand on it and you don't know that the one without the name brand was actually made in the exact same factory as the branded one and you're just paying for marketing and that they're the same and other times there is a big difference and I think when it comes to services whether it's whether it's law or medicine people are nervous you know if you're if you're facing criminal charges and and one attorney is $300 an hour and the other is 150 and the $300 attorney looks older than the other one who's 150, then you start making all kinds of assumptions and you wanna get that attorney if you can. And patients probably do some of the same thing. And so if you're a concierge practice and you were debating a price point between 400 and 600 a month, how many patients are you really gonna lose by lowering your price from, or excuse me, how many prices, how many practice, you know, patients are you gonna gain if you lower your price from 600 to 400? Probably not that much. So they just tend to stick with those higher prices because for those patients they're marketing themselves to, it's, it's sort of a Veblen good approach. Great point. Uh, the third question we had, uh, can both models be practiced simultaneously? And I think Dr. Eskew, you wanted to tackle this one. Yeah, I, I, I kind of jumped ahead of myself and talked about that some earlier. I Legally the answer is yes, but 99% of the time that's a wrong decision because it's very nuanced to do it that way and it doesn't really make business sense. So I would I would pick one or the other and I, I think we kind of went into detail on that earlier so I won't rehash it again. Okay. Uh, number four kind of goes hand in hand with that uh, talking about Medicare. Yeah if so if you haven't opted out of Medicare can you see cash paying patients? There are ways to do that. The the regular most you know, the, the regular answer I give people is if you know you want to do DPC, then you know that you don't want to do third party fee for service billing. And if you want to see a Medicare patient under a private contract 
or covered services, then the only legal way to do all those things is to opt out. If you wanted to do a concierge arrangement with a Medicare patient, then you still must bill Medicare for the covered services so that you can make your non-covered services argument and start to have a monthly fee for those. So those are the two ways you can go about it. If you're a new DPC physician, a lot of times you build a wait list of Medicare patients who wanna join and then you keep moonlighting and eventually your wait list is big enough and you're tired of all that moonlighting work that you say, all right, I'm ditching Medicare because I, I don't need a moonlight and I know I'm gonna have 30 people that join the day I, the day I make that step. So that's how I usually approach these kinds of situations. Great. I don't, I don't mean to rush through. I just wanted to, we want to stay on, t on time if we can for everyone, but a couple more of these. Uh, number five, can uh, cost and health outcomes for each model be objectively measured? Uh, I would say thoughts? yes. Yeah. Yes, they can be. Um, but I, I don't believe that doing traditional coding is going to accurately reflect what you do. The, the, the used to be there was no good answer for this. Now there are better and better answers and they're related around CCM and RPM because those are designed to have monthly bills go through. So if you're doing what we call ghost claiming, meaning you're not actually charging, but you're just putting a claim in the chart to track things, then for patients who do have some chronic conditions that you're monitoring, those start to reflect the value of your services. Do you feel uh, as a follow-up, uh, and, and Dr. Rolf, you can chime in because you talked about this during your presentation, that there is a, a discernible distinction between the two models when it comes to cost and health outcomes? I'm leading the yeah. witness, of course, I think so. Yes, and you do too. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, I don't, well, here's what I, here's the most I can say about that. I have a lot more time now to do patient education. I talk a lot more now about um, nutrition, exercise, lifestyle habits, sleep, stress levels. Before people were always stressed out and I could never talk about it because I had to talk about their thyroid and their diabetes in 12 minutes. And so we, I could never address those lifestyle things or just personal trauma. Um, so I have a whole lot more time to dive a lot deeper into people's personal lives and their lifestyle habits. Um, and I do a lot more counseling now than I ever did before. So the question is, can that be objectively measured? I'm sure it can be. And I know lots of studies have looked at the benefits of counseling for nutrition and weight loss and things like that. Well, the most I can speak to is the fact that I have time now personally myself to do the counseling and I don't have to send them out to talk to a nutritionist or a dietitian or just not address a lot of the lifestyle topics. Great. Uh, number six, any thoughts uh, from either of you how this can move to the specialty world? I think anytime you've got a patient who is seeing a physician for an ongoing chronic condition, then a monthly or periodic fee of some variety makes a lot of sense. If you're a neurologist and you're seeing a patient routinely for multiple sclerosis, this makes sense. Uh, if you're a cardiologist and you're seeing them all the time for evolving uh, congestive heart failure where the ejection fraction is worsening over time and you're debating AICDs and you're, you know, then it makes sense. Um, anybody who's not uh, doing those one-off acute visits, then I think it's a good idea. So certain, the, the ones who would have the, I think almost any internal medicine subspecialty could do this. I think a general surgeon, it makes, you know, it's more difficult for, I'm not sure how many, you know, maybe, maybe you've got a patient with hydradenitis and they're having surgery all the time because that's kind of recurrent. Maybe then you would see a general surgeon in, in a model like this, but most of the time, whatever they're doing for you is done once and, and then there's a follow-up visit or two and then you move on. So those are the groups where it would be harder. Makes sense. And I think as we see the, the proliferation of this, these models at the primary care level, the move to specialists becomes inevitable as that patient um, population grows and, and seeks those, type, those types of services under the same type of model. So hopefully we're going to see that um, unfolding. Uh, number seven, uh, main obstacles faced by DPC. Uh, I know we're running short on time. Can you just bullet point a couple, uh, each one of you, just what you see as main obstacles facing DPC today? I can, Two I can patients. Go. Oh, go okay, ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Well, so Dr. Eske, you can probably speak a whole lot more to the legal side of it. The, the main obstacle for me was I just didn't know much about it. Um, so I had to talk to lots of people to learn not only how the model works, but how do I even get started? Most of us that went to medical school have very little business experience. So I really had to learn about 
the the goings on and the workings of a business in the background and how to get started. Um, so I needed resources. I just, I just didn't have the knowledge in my mind. So that was my obstacle. And then I had to spend months and months getting that information. Once you have it, if you have the right relationships or like Adam, you guys at Freedom HealthWorks helped me get those relationships, then you're off and running. But it was initially just figuring out, well, what's my starting point for me? I would echo that. Too few patients are asking for it or demanding it, and consequently, too few physicians are looking into it. Mm -hmm. uh, DPC isn't easy. This is not like a permanent vacation for the physician. It's work, but it's work you actually enjoy, and it's work that lets you get smarter and better because you have the time to do, those, do research and have follow-up conversations with patients. And that's very different than what the hospital would have you do if you're a hospital employee where you're on a hamster wheel and you use a fraction of, of the knowledge that you had and you let your brain atrophy and you never really have to learn anything new because they don't want you to. They don't give you the time to do that. If you don't know an answer off the top of your head, you're supposed to refer and move on to the next patient. And this, is, this inverts all of that. So the, the patient needs to want it and demand it and the, and, the, and the family physician, family nurse practitioner, whoever it is, they've got to... Um, you know, they've, they've got to be willing to put in that extra work and, and become smarter and become better and provide that value. Appreciate it. Last question, and then we'll wrap this. Um, which model do you feel best facilitates patient care while minimizing patient cost? Far away. Well, that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a layup, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, D DPC, obviously, that's why we do it. Um, I, I do, you know, the, the exception on the concierge side, I suppose, would be um, people that are, are forced into it from a regulatory standpoint, and, and that's a, a narrow group. Um, the main ones that I would think of would be your um, practices in Colorado or Kentucky that still want to be open to Medicaid patients for some sort of monthly fee basis. So there it is illegal to privately contract with those patients for any covered services. So the only way to see them under a monthly fee model is to do a concierge model, even if it's low priced. So uh, other than that, um, I, I don't think there's, if you sort of look at both things and understand and want to do DPC, I, I don't think there's too much reason why you would conclude you'd want to do concierge. Uh, from, a, from a physician standpoint, I think concierge is harder as well because you have to be willing to spend more time with some patients than you do others. And it's hard for me to provide basically a different quality of care for some than, than others based on these categories. Super. Thank you, Dr. Alp. Anything to add or we'll, we'll wrap this up? No, I think that wraps it up. Yeah, that's great. Wonderful. Well, thank you both for participating. I want to uh, just throw the next series uh, webinar schedule up on the screen for you. So the next episode three will be Thriving in Independent Practice, Thursday, June the 24th. So be sure to tune in as well as every webinar thereafter, all leading up to our first freedom.conference conference this October. So for those of you who weren't around for episode one, uh, October 22nd to 24th, we're gonna bring everybody together and keep this momentum rolling. So thank you again to our panelists today, Dr. Phil Eskew, Dr. Ashley Alp, very much appreciate your time. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Lean Frontiers. Uh, Skylar, back to you. Okay, that is all from us today. Thank you all for attending. And just a reminder that you will receive a link to view this recording within 24 to 48 hours. Thank you, Adam, Philip, and Ashley. Y'all have a nice day. Thank you. Hey.